Hello everyone, this is The Final Boss Man, and on today's episode, it's just business, baby! Welcome to the show, I am Kyle Bossman, and I am feeling cynical this week, which I know is not normally my thing. I too think cynicism is unappealing. However, I, I can't help it <laughs> this week. I'm in this thing, uh, and today I, I just want to talk about something. You don't have to do that. Uh, basically, what happened was, last week, 2K, announced Borderlands, the pre-sequel. Not sure where the exclamation point goes, so I gave it to both. Uh, this is a game that takes place before the events of Borderlands 2 and uh, is available only on the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC. Uh, when uh, revealing the game, Randy Pitchford, president of Gearbox, told Eurogamer, it's not free to build a game for next gen, which should have been enough. That, that's good, I get that. That, <laughs> that makes sense to me. We know what this game is. However, Pitchford, like, he kept going on, on this weird defensive rationalization for why this game will not be on 8th gen consoles. His own words, if you try to image the set of Borderlands players who have already upgraded, that's not 100%. But if you try to image the set of Xbox One or PS4 owners who do not have an Xbox 360 or PS3, the difference is so close to nil, you can't make a business rationalization around that. You hear that, Batman Arkham Knight? Your decision to go 8th gen only is financially irrational. Good luck making a buck on that one, you dum-dums. You're gonna be out on the streets wearing barrels while Randy Pitchford leans back in his giant Texas jacuzzi, laughing it up and drinking champagne while you find yourselves scrounging for pennies in the streets of London. You're not gonna find pennies in London, are you, Rocksteady? Reason why I don't feel too bad making fun of Pitchford here is I don't believe he believes his own nonsense. Uh, more quotes from him. Uh, that demand lives on the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC. We don't know to what extent it'll live on the next gen. I imagine over time, maybe by the time we get to the third or fourth Christmas, there will be enough of an install base. Currently there is, between the PS3 and Xbox 360, over 150 million installed units worldwide. Probably 170 million is more realistic, which, quick aside, is generous. Uh, there are fewer Xbox Ones and PS4s than we sold copies of Borderlands 2. Not only is that flawed logic, because you're not going to sell 8.5 million copies of the pre-sequel, uh, it's simply not true. We know uh, Take-Two announced in February that Borderlands 2 shipped. 8.5 million copies, which is a lot. Best for a 2K game ever, congratulations. However, we know for sure that at least 3.9 million Xbox Ones shipped and 6 million PS4 sold. So if you add those together, that's 9.9 .9 million by my math. Seems a lot more than 8.5, and that's, that's old numbers. NPD announcements come later this week. That statement's just gonna become more untrue. What are you doing, man? You don't have to do <laughs> just like, you have to make up these weird rations. Just admit this is a little money game. I don't know. I think that 8.5 million Borderlands 2 sold has kind of gone to 2K's head. The name itself, Borderlands the pre-sequel, is fun. It's funny. It, it, to me, it's so obtuse that it seems unenjoyable to anyone who hasn't already played the game. It needs one of those 8.5 million people to even appreciate this title. It's like Lion King 1 and a half. I'm never going to see Lion King 1 and a half. I don't care what happened to Timon and Pumbaa between Lion King 1 and 2. Uh, same thing, I don't care what happened on the moon in the Borderlands universe. Still pretend like that story matters. <laughs> this is really gonna go to the backstory, Handsome Jack, everyone's favorite character. Who like, okay. Um, and so it, it's that, it's that I feel like with video games, the word prequel has frequently come to mean this is a less than game. Hey everybody, uh, we're not ready to make a sequel but we made this game quickly. Uh, it's not gonna be as good as the last game you played, but it will be $60. Please enjoy. And that's it, and, and, and sometimes we do. I mean, that's why People Can Fly had to make Gears of War Judgment, a game that takes place before the events of Gears of War, and why Batman Arkham Origins takes place before the events of Batman Arkham Asylum. Like God of War Ascension takes place before the events of Gears It's like, this thing takes place before the events. Like, that's an exciting thing. We know better, we know now what that means. That means you're making a cheap sequel. The thing is, uh, 
uh, Retro was given Metroid, right? And at the time, Nintendo was like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. This takes place before the events of Super Metroid, so don't worry about that. And Metroid Prime rules. Metroid Prime is probably the best prequel ever, so there's definitely a sliding scale for this kind of thing, right? And even the games on this end of the sliding scale, the cheapest prequels of all, are still enjoyed by people, right? They're still fun to people. People still buy them and don't feel disappointed. So who am I to feel sour about this, right? Borderlands, the pre-sequel, will be fun. People will buy it and enjoy it. So where's the fuss? I don't know, I, I think I might be spoiled by all this good TV and books and music. These, these things are things that are, yes, made for money. They exist to make money, but they're things in which the creator is valued and has control. Breaking Bad, viewership actually increased season to season. There was no financially good reason to stop it there. However, serious creator Vince Gilligan said, I want to end it after five years. And it's like, Vince, baby, you're leaving money on the table. He says, I don't care. This is my thing. I'm ending it after five seasons. Maybe a bad example, though, because Breaking Bad will have a spin-off series called Better Call Saul, which will take place before the events of Breaking Bad. Oh, you know what, though? Uh, there's J.K. Rowling, right? She wrote Harry Potter books. She wrote seven and said, I'm going to end there. It's like, J.K. Rowling, baby, you're leaving money on the table. <laughs> it's like, these are, you're, giving, you're costing us money by not making more. And she's, no, I'm writing seven. I'm going to end it there. And you know what? I'm going to make a crazy long epilogue just so that I make sure it stops there. And it's just, sorry, this is, that's the end. Though, I guess maybe it's another bad example because J.K. Rowling is writing a trilogy of movies based on a book she wrote for charity called The Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Uh, but get this, it takes place before the events of Harry Potter. So I guess, <laughs> I guess it is everywhere, man. It's all everywhere. That's why I'm cynical today. It feels like creators don't even have control of their own creations. You think of Hideo Kojima, and he always says, he said for the last four Metal Gears that this is my last one. Metal Gear Solid 2, this is my last one. Metal Gear Solid 3, oh, this is my last one. Metal Gear Solid 4 is just, oh, this is my last one. And he's not like, he's not lying to like hype up the game. He genuinely does not want to make Metal Gear Solid games anymore. However, he is vice president of Konami Digital Entertainment. And that is a publisher who has two or maybe three consistently profitable franchises right now. And it is financially responsible of him to make more good Metal Gear Solid games. He kind of has to, he's stuck in it. Similarly, 2K has to keep making Bioshock games. That Bioshock games make money, they have to keep making them to make money. Ken Levine doesn't want to make Bioshock games anymore. It's okay, Mr. Levine, here's your own little studio where you can make new games. We're gonna keep making Bioshock games without you. You can't touch them, they're ours now. Crazy, it's, it's why I'm feeling cynical. And you know what, I kind of, I want to give credit to Phil Fish actually. Last year, after getting fed up with the people of the internet, some people specifically, uh, he canceled Fez 2. This was a highly anticipated sequel to a very successful game of his, and he single-handedly said, no, it's not happening. This is money that is assured to me in his sequel. I'm going to say no to it. That's pretty cool. In fact, a lot of indie developers don't make sequels to their games. There's no Super Meat Boy sequel, right? There's no Journey 2. Uh, and it, it's just sort of nice to see because it feels like the big companies more and more are just making video games to make money and and it feels like love evaporates in those situations you know it feels like their primary goal is to get dollars out of our wallets that that better experiences and better graphics are just on this path to better profits it feels like sometimes the guys up top don't even care about video games. <sighs> In other news, uh, Nintendo had a surprise Nintendo Direct last week for a childish Japanese 3DS game nobody cares about called Tomodachi Life. I found a heart treasure map. 
Inside a bottle washed ashore. You go back? I want to see how this plays out. And when I followed the dotted line, it led me to you forever more. So, will you be my sweetheart? Wait. I love you too. I love you more. Wait. I love you the most. No way. No way. Samus, who do you choose? Iwata, I'm so glad you feel the same. So yeah, I mean, look at that thing. Yes. Nintendo can make Rusty's Real Deal Baseball one week, the, the game that has most literally solicited money from me that I've ever seen in my life, but then they can also make weird video games and videos about them like this that can warm even the coldest cynical cynic's heart. Crazy. I appreciate that. Also, I actually want to say that I appreciated the Smash Bros. Direct last week, which was hosted by the game's director Masahiro Sakurai, uh, just seemed very aware of the audience that he had. It was, he started off, Sakurai started off the whole thing by first giving us the release schedule for the new Smash Bros. games, which blows, by the way. Uh, then the second thing he said was a technical tidbit, was talking about the game's frame rate, because he knows we care. It was funny, it was informative, and frequently surprising. And I think even if you have no interest in Smash Bros., that direct is still worth watching, just as a great example of how to showcase information for an upcoming game. Bad example, the Borderlands 2 announcement. Uh, this thing, it was just, it was Randy Pitchford and 2K Australia's general manager, Tony Lawrence, sitting in weird chairs and, and telling us how exciting it is that our jetpacks will drain the re same resource as our oxygen tanks. If you were concerned that this was a cheap cash-in, look at this announcement. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to spend money. I'm saying you should spend effort on your game's announcement. Because I, I get it. Games are expensive, more expensive than ever. And each new game is a risk. And a sequel, or at least a game within a franchise, is a smaller risk. And it's because we like sequels. It's our fault, that's on us. We love those things. We, we like a game and we want more of it. However, sometimes the best thing to do for a game series, not financially, but for the health of your brand and the specialness of your franchise is just to let it lie for a while and maybe make something else. In summary, end like friends, don't end like Joey. That is the episode for this week. If you're on Twitter, you can find me at Kyle Bossman. I will be back here next Wednesday. Hope to see you then. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, just wanted to update you on my quest to find a Harry Potter game that I like. Uh, last week, commenter KingDoug87 suggested Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, uh, which is great because yes, you do get to wander around Hogwarts with no loading screens. It's just a giant castle. Uh, which I do love. I guess my problem is that during Harry's teenage years, everything is strangely serious and, and the environment is full of anxiety. So I don't like enjoy going around the castle at this moment. Like it's just totally inconsistent. Harry Potter one moment is saying, Voldemort is trying to kill me. We must make an army. But then is just trying to recruit people and they're saying, sure Harry, I'll join your army if you help me get this book off of this bookshelf. Sure. And then he waves his wand and takes the book off the bookshelf. Uh, and uh, there's no like collectibles. You don't collect wizard cards 
or, or, or jelly beans, you just collect this one thing called discovery orbs. That you just give her like shaking stuff around the castle. To me, this is ridiculous. Even in this explicitly magical world, makes no sense. Uh, I gotta, I gotta not like this game. However, there is one redeeming thing that I think makes it a beautiful game. And this is right about here, I'm about to show you. Look at this. They don't even, they don't care. They just stand right back up and take some more. <laughs> they like Harry so much that they're just willing to put up with this. Uh, anyway, on to the next Harry Potter game, I suppose. If you have a recommendation, please comment below. And I will see you next week, everybody. Bye. <laughs>